<laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, you recorded. I guess not. Um, hold. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everybody, and welcome, and thank you uh, for being here. My name is Simone Tamoro, and I'm the director of the Institute for Doctoral Studies in the Visual Arts, a low residency program in art theory and philosophy based in Portland, Maine, uh, but truly nomadic in spirit. It is my great pleasure to host the, uh, the third lecture of the second part of this year-long symposium uh, titled on the Anthropocene either or that we launched back in spring 2021 uh, with a series of lectures by renowned theorists, artists, and philosophers. Uh, the symposium addresses, broadly speaking, the role of art and philosophy in relation to questions of ecology, climate change, coexistence, and sustainability as an existential urgency of our times. Uh, some of you may remember we started with a lecture by Howard Cagle, followed by a lecture by Dayan Lukic, and today we have the pleasure to host Dr. Elina Staiku, who will talk of the Nitrogen Anthropocene. Professor Staiku is a lecturer in modern liberal arts at Winchester University and a member of the faculty at IDSVA. And I wish to thank her for being here and sharing her current scholarship with us. I would also like to thank uh, Patricia Tinajero, a PhD candidate at IDSVA, who will help us with the technicalities of this webinar. And uh, Novel Schollers, also a PhD candidate, um, who will give a brief introduction to Professor Staipu and take the questions after the talk. Before that, though, let me go over a few technical details with you. Uh, the lecture will last approximately one hour. We'll take a five minute break after that and take questions from the audience following it. So that should go on for at least 30 minutes, maybe more. Um, you're welcome to write your questions in the Q&A box. There is a dedicated uh, Q&A area for your questions. Um, we will then read them uh, out loud during the Q&A session. Um, we also, we may go, we may post a few things in the chat box, uh, for example, links to upcoming lectures, uh, but a chat box shouldn't really be used for Q&A. So try to use the other um, area. Uh, the lecture will be recorded and published on our Vimeo site, and I will post the link uh, shortly. Uh, finally, let me remind you that after today, we have one remaining lecture planned on December 11. And in the chat box, you can find a link to register to the remaining lecture. All right. Um, and now I would like to leave the podium to Novel Schollers. Thank you all and enjoy the talk. Thank you so much, Professor Morrow. I'm Novel Idea Scholers of Cohort 16, and I'm very honored to uh, be introducing Dr. Steku, uh, who has been patiently, as a matter of fact, working with me on my dissertation process. Dr. Alina Steku is an associate lecturer in uh, modern liberal arts at Winchester University. Professor Steku is the author of Deconstruction at Home, metaphors of travel and writing, and of articles on contemporary philosophy, literature, and biomedicine. She participated in, IDS, in the IDSVA Athens Symposium with a talk on migration and hospitality, of which I had the pleasure to attend. It seems a natural and certainly timely progression, or better, expansion of thinking through our human flow and relationships with each other with respect to hospitality, to now thinking through and feeling through, if I might add, our geological relationship with our planet with a view towards a more hospitable balance. With this in mind, Professor Steku will be looking at what she calls the nitrogen Anthropocene and what it entails for us today. The focus will be on soil, our symbiotic condition with it and notions of its care moving towards the ethics of compost which would involve seeing ourselves in relation in a relation of cohabitation with the more than human, or to speak in terms of hospitality, rather as guests than masters. I am very happy to introduce Dr. Alina Steku, Thinking the Nitrogen Anthropocene. Thank you, 
Thank you very much, Nova, for this wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, many thanks to, to George and uh, Simonetta. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, many thanks to George and Simonetta for inviting me to participate in this extremely engaging and thought-provoking series on the Anthropocene either or. It is always great to be part of RDSVA events. And this is for me also an opportunity to bring together some of the questions, areas and concerns that have been driving my recent research and perhaps push them even further into thinking what I have called the nitrogen Anthropocene. Let me start by saying that when Simonetta asked me for a title for my talk, and I use this term, the nitrogen anthropocene, which almost seemed obvious to me for what I wanted to do for this lecture. I was not proposing, and I'm still not proposing a new term or specification for the anthropocene. Coming to it from a preoccupation with the topics of agricultural sustainability, food systems, and the question of eating well in the 21st century, eating as an ethical, political, and ecological act. And perhaps most of all, to go back to Wendell Berry's famous saying, as an agricultural act, I wanted to highlight a concern or area in our discourse on the Anthropocene that tends to be for reasons that we can talk about, underestimated or overlooked, at least in comparison with what we most commonly associate the Anthropocene with carbon dioxide and the impact that the high atmospheric concentration of this greenhouse gas is having on the climate and the planet. As you surely know, the climate and environmental emergencies that we are all confronting and already living through and some more than others is largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions such as carbon dioxide, methane and nitru nitrous oxide, which is a nitrogen pollutant. Well, we know that they are all very dangerous. We have perhaps been more concerned about carbon dioxide's atmospheric concentration levels, which are in any case the ones that usually make the news and are estimated to have increased due to human activity by 48% since the Industrial Revolution began. You've probably heard that methane, whose atmospheric concentration has more than doubled since pre-industrial times and is increasing fast, is supporting greenhouse gas ten, tens of times more powerful than carbon dioxide at warming the atmosphere, but perhaps also that as a short-lived climate pollutant with an atmospheric lifetime of roughly a decade is second to carbon dioxide in driving climate change. But you probably haven't heard that nitrogen is a greenhouse gas that is 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. That means it has about 300 times the warning impact of CO2 and whose natural cycle has been thrown out of balance through human and mostly agricultural activity, especially due to the intensive use of chemical fertilizers. And still, nitrogen greenhouse emissions are not that much talked about. If you look, for example, at the evidence for climate change on NASA's Global Climate Change website, you will see that there is only specific mention of the heat trapping nature of carbon dioxide and other gases and of the burning of fossil fuels as the human activity that has primarily and fundamentally increased the concentration of greenhouse gases. If you look at the enumeration of vital signs for global climate change on the same website, only CO2 levels make it on the list. If you visit the UN Environment, Environment Program website, there is more information on nitrogen pollution and why nitrogen management is key for climate change mitigation. But also it is admitted that relatively little research has been done specifically on how improved management of the nitrogen uh, cycle can have beneficial effects towards that direction. And still, 
globally the use of synthetic fertilizers, by far the worst source of nitrogen pollution, is increasing in a big way, with 32% rise recorded since 2002. We need to hear a lot more about nitrogen. and the nitrogen emergency. Andrew Zaleski in The New Scientist calls it a forgotten environmental crisis, a crisis largely driven by the excessive production of ammonia, one of the four main types of reactive nitrogen, which is mainly used as fertilizer and what he writes has tipped the nitrogen cycle widely out of balance. This profound human modification of the end cycle has clearly smashed through a planetary boundary, having an influence on human life support systems regionally, as well as planetary impact that makes it a key process of the Anthropocene. We may ask why is nitrogen pollution, the nitrogen Anthropocene, not as much talked about? Why is it that even in studies and reports on agriculture as one of the main drives of climate change, the focus falls more on CO2 emissions and less on the nitrogen challenge? Back in 2011, the United Nations Environment Program asked Mark Sutton, an expert on nitrogen pollution at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, to undertake the first global assessment of the problem to determine how bad it was, what to expect in the future and how to fix it. A few years later, Sutton became the head of an UN-backed project aiming to develop an international nitrogen management system. The aim was to do for nitrogen what the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change had done for CO2. Saturn and other nitrogen experts collaborating on this project quickly realized that asking the world to cut nitrogen use in agriculture would meet a lot of resistance, notably from the powerful fertilizer industry. In the end, they opted to call for nitrogen waste to be cut instead. Up to 58% of the nitrogen fertilizer isn't taken up by crops anyway. This led to a meeting held by the UN in Colombo, Sri Lanka in 2019 and to the Colombo Declaration, which launched the UN Global Campaign on Sustainable Nitrogen Management, a roadmap for halving nitrogen waste by 2030. Only 14 nations have uh, signed up so far, including the Fiji Islands and Palestine. The US and the UK were represented in the meeting, but as far as I know, have not signed up yet. So where are we now? When we talk about the nitrogen Anthropocene, we are mainly talking about synthetic chemical fertilizers, the kind of agriculture they support and its sustainability. We are ultimately talking about food systems, the kind of food we eat and the kind of act we perform when we are eating it. We are ultimately talking about what kind of eaters we are. We've known for a while that food systems are directly related to the Anthropocene and to the nitrogen challenge. In January 2019, the Eat Lancet Commission published a report with the title, Our Food in the Anthropocene, Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems, linking unequivocally human health with the health of the planet and calling for immediate action and the global adoption of healthy diets from sustainable food systems so as to safeguard the planet and improve the health of billions. This is described in the report as a win-win situation. Eat healthily and save the planet. It's interesting and unsurprising in the context of the Anthropocene that the health of the planet if it makes any sense to uh, employ that category, the, th the healthy planet at all, is linked and even equated to that of humans. The report is presented as the first full scientific view of what constitutes a healthy diet from a sustainable food system and which actions can support and speed up 
the radical transformation of the global food system that is urgently needed. If you have the chance to look at it, you will see apart from the tables and figures analyzing agricultural data and projecting different scenarios, images of colorful and palatable plant-based dishes proposed as healthy and sustainable diet, scenic images of grazing cows and of unperturbed wildlife. The pressing question of the report, however, which uh, was put to the world leading scientists that drafted it was this, can we feed a future population of 10 billion people a healthy diet within planetary boundaries? You've probably heard of this um, projection before, the milestone year of uh, 2050 when the human population on Earth is expect expected to reach from the current 7.9 billion to 10 billion. When I was looking at these figures up, I saw that uh, there is actually what's uh, called the worldometer that is measuring population growth and is taken away as we speak. I find it an amazing, perhaps overwhelming fact that only during my lifetime, the human population on this planet has more than doubled in size. And this is largely because, and, and we will come to it in a moment, of the industrial production of chemical fertilizers because of the human manipulation of the nitrogen cycle. We are beginning to understand then why this is such a thorny and complicated issue and why the nitrogen anthropocene is not as much talk, talked about. To go back briefly to the Eat Lancet uh, report and to the urgent question of how can we feed a future population of 10 billion people and we, who are this we that has burdened itself with the duty of feeding the world? So notwithstanding the problematic formulation and assumptions behind this question, and we will come to it later from the perspective of agroecology and the kind of answer or answers proposed by physicist, writer, eco-feminist and agroecology activist, Vantana Shiva. The report is right to argue that food will be a defining issue of the 21st century and that, and, um, that, that what is called the global food system is unsustainable or even absurd and that we are increasingly moving closer to an unprecedented in scale and severity, global food prices and insecurity. But then the report goes to say in the language of development, investment and opportunity that, and I quote, the unlocking of the food's potential will catalyze the achievement of both the SDGs that you and sustainable development goals and Paris Agreement. An unprecedented opportunity exists to develop food system as a common thread between many international, national and business policy frameworks aiming for improved human health and environmental sustainability, end of quote. I am in no way disputing the scientific grounds of the report or the targets and strategies it sets up for what it calls the great food transformation. I would like, however, to draw attention to the fact that here once more, and although this is about food production, more weight seems to be placed on the need to decarbonize the global energy system and to achieve a shift from land use being a net source of carbon to becoming a net sink of carbon. This transition and boundary estimates would also include an assessment of the maximum amount uh, of what are here called non-CO2 gases, that is methane and nitrous oxide, that have been assessed as both necessary and hard to further reduce at least before 2050. Part of the strategy includes the re distribution of global use of nitrogen and phosphorus. But it seems that the report, when it states that the current global food system, and let us note here that these issues are always addressed on the global scale and thus demanding global and centralized solutions, 
requires a new agricultural revolution that is based on sustainable intensification and driven by sustainability and system innovation. This is using the language and a concept of sustainability in a way that has been historically a part, if not the cause of the problem. What would a new agricultural revolution be or mean? And how could it not make us recall what Shiva has called the violence of the Green Revolution? Before we look into these questions and turn to Siva's account and critique of the experiment known as the Green Revolution in India in the 1960s, we would need to have a clearer sense of the kind and magnitude of the challenge, the nitrogen challenge that we are measuring ourselves against. When Dutch meteorologist and atmospheric chemist Paul Crutchen first used the term Anthropocene in 2002, which has now entered common parlance, to describe the human-dominated geological epoch supplementing the Holocene, the warm and stable period of the past 10, 12 millennia, which he dated back to the latter part of the 18th century and the invention of the steam agent, its association with the dangers involved in the growing global concentrations of carbon dioxide and methane was clear. Since then, we have heard a lot about this debatable and profoundly problematic term, disputes about the Anthropocene's plausible beginnings, meanings, and ends, so many disconcerting things about its link to environmental disaster and climate change. But we are also beginning to understand more and in more nuanced ways the kind of social, racial, and species violence and injustices underlying it. I would like to single out here Catherine uh, Yosef's groundbreaking uh, book, A Billion Black Anthropocenes on, uh, on uh, 2018, which unearths the sentimentation and tight entanglement of the most violent racial and extractionist reasoning within what is called white geology and its grammar of the inhuman as the other side of white biocentrism and its anthropocenic subject. I would also like to single out Anna Ching's book, The Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist Ruins, uh, 2017, that comes to reflect on the present predicament and precarity from the end of this history and in the midst of its blasted forests, where still multi species world making is teaching us the arts of living on a damaged planet. In a way, what we are calling here the nitrogen Anthropocene would be a much easier and more directly um, uh, epoch uh, to identify as it goes back to the invention of a process around the years 1909 and 1910 in Germany that could be characterized as the most important technical invention of the 20th century, more important than airplanes, nuclear energy, space flight, television and computers, which invention that of the so-called Harbour Boss process. If you've never heard of this before, it may come as a surprise, but perhaps this is also symptomatic of the consistent and stubborn overlooking of nitrogen pollution in comparison to other pollutants. Vaclav Schmil, showed the epochal significance of this process, that is nitrogen fixation and its commercialization in his thorough study enriching the earth, Fritz Haber, Carl Boss, and the transformation of world food production published in 2002, the same year as Kratzen's era defined in article. However, in comparison to Kratzen's carbon anthropocene, we know very little about the Haber Bos extraction of nitrogen that arguably marks the beginning of the nitrogen anthropocene. Fritz Haber was a German chemist and the first to fix nitrogen synthetically in the lab, and Carl Bos, the entrepreneur 
that made possible the industrial production and commercialization of synthetic ammonia, the nitrogen compound that is used in agriculture as fertilizer, but also in the manufacture of explosives, pesticides, and plastics. Why is this so important? Nitrogen is a key and vital ingredient to life. It is present in every living cell, in the nucleotides of nucleic acids in the DNA and uh, RNA, in all proteins, and the enzymes which control the chemistry of living beings. Our bodies contain about one kilogram of it in tissue. And although we, as all life forms, are characterized as carbon-based, carbon being carbon life's uh, principal structural element, and far more abundant in the biosphere than nitrogen, Smil calls the former the supplier of quantity and the latter the key provider of quality. Without nitrogen, our bodies are incapable of synthesizing proteins, growing tissues, and maintaining themselves. We get, we get most of the nitrogen we need to grow and survive from our food directly in staple cereal and legume grains and indirectly in animal products and aquatic species. Before the herbivores process was established, agriculture, which has been described as the production of digestible nitrogen, used the available biofixated nitrogen, that is nitrogen that flows and is fixed through natural processes, mainly by lightning and by certain types of bacteria, which are symbiotic to legumes and are the unique carriers of a specialized enzyme, enzyme that can sever nitrogen's strong molecular bond. Nitrogen gas is the most abundant element in the atmosphere, making up about 80% of its volume and unusually stable, inert, and non-reactive. When it goes through fixation by reaction with uh, hydrogen, hydrogen gas over a catalyst, the product of the process is ammonia, the nourishing compound. All nutrition depends on nitrogen's biospheric cycle from the atmosphere's enormous stores to soils, plants, and water, and the heterotrophs that feed on them, animals and people. After plants and heterotrophs die, their enzymatic decomposition, uh, what is called ammonification, returns nitrogen to the atmosphere, completing the cycle. Metabolic wastes of ingested nitrogen are leakages or detours within the nitrogen cycle, and what, according to Smil, links through volatilization or life with the atmosphere. All living things linked through their metabolisms participate in the nitrogen flow. We will later see some of the ontological and ethical extensions of this connectedness in what Maria Puig de la, de la Casa, thinker of human soil relations, called, calls food web. And philosopher Thomas Nail, thinker of motion, calls metabolic communism. So the growing of all food, at least before the early 20th century, depended mainly on the work of microorganisms on bacterial nitrogen fixation. This dependency was, was well known by chemists and agronomists who also understood well the need for overcoming it and securing new sources of fixed nitrogen to extend the limited supply provided by the traditional recycling of organic waste and planting of leguminous crops. This, for some, as early as the end of the 19th century, already loomed as an existential threat to humanity, especially in view of the rising demand for food by the fast-growing human population in the rapidly industrializing and urbanized world. The fixation of nitrogen, which was seen as vital to the progress and survival of civilized humanity, was going to be achieved by Fritz Haber in the first decade of the 20th century. Boss was quick to recognize what was at stake with Haber's breakthrough technique that was able to replicate what bacteria had been doing for billions of years in the lab and its commercial attraction. Commercializing this process meant overcoming 
manifold engineering challenges and developing a new field of large scale high pressure, high temperature synthesis, which is extremely energy intensive and relies on the combustion of uh, fossil fuels. That's also significant, significantly contributing to CO2 emissions. The first ammonia plant opened at uh, Opal as early as 1910. And because of its extraordinary scale and infrastructure that possessed unprecedented volumes of pressurized gas, which required the construction of lengthy pipelines carried on elevated structures, the plant acquired a look unlike that of any other previous chemical enterprise. For Smil, commercial ammonia synthesis was one of the most remarkable industrial undertakings of modern civilization. When World War I broke out, ammonia synthesis and the harbor boost process was put to the service of the military effort and the production of explosives for trench warfare. Synthetic fertilizers and explosives use the same chemicals. When heated in a confined space, ammonia nitrate, the leading fertilizer, can result in highly destructive explosions. I'm sure you recall the horrific explosion of stored uh, synthetic fertilizers in uh, August 2020 at the port of Beirut that killed hundreds, injured thousands and devastated the whole area. Unsurprisingly, there was heavy reinvestment in large expansions of this industry, which after World War II and looking for new markets went back to the production of synthetic fertilizers and aggressively promoted the model of chemical agriculture. According to Vandana Shiva, we are still eating World War II leftovers. Although the global output of ammonia began to rise after 1950, first thanks to the rapid growth of US production, and then as a result of the Green Revolution in the 1960s, the harbor boss process was to be the beginning of a geoengineering experiment, an epoch that is now posing its own existential threat to humanity, and is what has thrown the nitrogen cycle even more dangerously out of balance than CO2. Here's a wrap and what makes the nitrogen challenge extremely difficult to handle or even to begin to address. The rapid growth of human and domestic animal population demanded, but was also enabled by the rise in food production through nitrogen fixation or extraction. Smil states that during the 1990s, globally synthetic fertilizers provided about half of the total nutrient available to annual and permanent crops and are the dominant sources of the nutrient in all of the world's most intensely cultivated agroecosystems, be they the cornfields of the US Midwest, wheatlands of Atlantic Europe or paddies of South China. In 2002, when this study was published, Smil concluded with a high degree of confidence that the harbor boss synthesis of ammonia had recently been supplying about half of the total nutrient input into the world's agriculture. 20 years later, and although the use of ammonia in agriculture has been decreasing in the West, it is still rising in developing countries and Smil's projections for the future seem to be accurate. Back in 2002, Smil argued that the harbor boss synthesis of ammonia provided the very means of survival for about 40% of humanity. And when he was writing this, the human population was around 6 billion, nearly 2 billion less than it is in 2021. The existential dependence on this process was higher in low-income countries, which consumed in 1996 64% of the world's nitrogen fertilizers, heavily relying on it for supplying at least half of their food proteins. According to Smil, protein supply has not been a concern in affluent nations, which do not depend existentially on the harbor boss process. Intensive agriculture and high yielding cultivars 
in the West are less about survival and more about dietary choice. It adds more meat and dairy products to diets that were already sufficient in animal protein. At the same time, the growth of population in the Western world is slowing down and increasing in developing countries. And the next two billion uh, humans that may uh, be added to the global population by 2050 will inhabit countries like China, India, and Pakistan. Countries that seemingly existentially depend or to be more precise, were driven by Western extractionism to depend on chemical agribusiness. Whence the alleged imminent food crisis and insecurity and the extreme challenge of feeding the world with a sustainable food system. If the herbivores process is still considered indispensable for ensuring basic nutrition for some 60% of the world's people, to face this challenge, the world would uh, either need to intensify and further expand it, which would be an extremely costly choice in ecological and social terms, or would have to resort to a radical transformation of the food system, something advocated by the Eat Lancet report without, however, proposing a radical enough change in the dominant agricultural paradigm. Smil is pessimistic when it comes to the drastic changes in attitudes, especially when it comes to reducing meat and dairy cons consumption in the West and reverting to simple and more fragile diets containing more cereals and legumes. Needless to say, he writes, the chances of this dietary transformation are extremely slim, end of quote. I want to be very clear here. It seems that Smil's reasoning and projections may lead to arguments susceptible to a kind of neo-Malthusianism. Hints of that could be detected also in Paul Kratz's statement that launched the debate on the carbon anthropocene the same year. Such approaches would only perpetuate and even escalate the colonial violence that caused these predicaments in the first place in the worn-out name of a Western way of life. Well, truly sustainable solutions to such challenges can only come, we confidently argue, from a deep sense and commitment to environmental and food justice. We need, however, to be ready to hear more about nitrogen and the nitrogen challenge. No much has changed, at least with respect to public discussion and recognition of this crisis, since Smil wrote that in comparison to the effort devoted to the understanding of carbon and sulfur cycles and to the studies assessing the existing and potential impact of anthropogenic interferences in the two cycles, fertilizer-induced perturbances in nitrogen cycling have been a minor concern. In relative terms, human activities now perturb the global nitrogen, uh, nitrogen cycle to a greater extent than they interfere in the cycles of the other two doubly mobile elements, carbon and sulfur, end of quote. Well, high CO2 emissions could be foreseeably reduced and quite effectively so by means of various technical, economic and political solutions and the decarbonization of energy supply, there is no way, Smil writes, to grow crops and human bodies without nitrogen. And there, is, there are no imminent substitutes for the herbivores synthesis to which he credited the existence of nearly 2.5 billion people, nearly half of the world's population at the beginning of the 21st century. Where are we and where are we going? If the history of the herbivores process is indispensable for understanding how we got to where we are now at the age of the Anthropocene, there is still a history that we need to go back to in order to understand better where we are heading to and the kind of dilemmas we are facing. 
the experiment in geoengineering that was the commercialization of ammonia synthesis and its tremendous success happened also at an extreme ecological and social cost due to rapid, violent and exogenous changes in the societies which were mostly affected by the expansion of the fertilizer industry. I'm talking about the history of the Green Revolution in India in the 1960s, which Vantana Siva recounts in her 1991 book, The Violence of the Green Revolution, Third World Agriculture, Ecology and Politics. For Shiva, Green Revolution is a misleading name given to the chemical-based agricultural model that was introduced in India and other countries in the so-called Third World uh, uh, third world in the mid 60s. Another notable example is Mexico and had devastating effects for the local agricultures and communities and their biodiversity. And here for sure, there would be also different accounts and even triumphalist narratives uh, of success and progress. What happened in India and particularly in the Punjab region, which was selected for this agriculture and social experiment, was the wholesale transplantation of the American mechanistic, intensive and ultimately non-sustainable agricultural model and the displace, displacement of long traditional agrarian practices and traditional cultures of nitrogen capture. Private American foundations such as Ford and Rockefeller, the American government and the World Bank pushed for the introduction of these innovations, launching the intensive agricultural development program. After the wars, Shiva writes, there was cheap and abundant fertilizer in the West and American companies were anxious to ensure fertilizer consumption overseas to recoup their investment, end of quote. An opportunity presented itself for implementing this with a severe drop in food production in India in 1966 because of the drop and food aid was given to India by the US on the condition of an agreement to adopt the Green Revolution package. What was this package? Indian agriculture would be based on chemical fertilizers. Native seeds would be swapped by seeds, the so-called miracle seeds, engineered to respond well to these chemicals, and the rich local agri agricultural biodiversity would be replaced by genetically uniform monocultures of wheat and rice. While well, the higher yields of these cultivars benefited an elite of big farm owners and the Green Revolution is often credited with pulling millions of people out of hunger, Norman uh, Bocloud, the leading scientist of the project, who was also responsible for its aggressive promotion, even received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1970 following Fritz, Fritz Haber's for chemistry in 1918. The adverse consequences of the Green Revolution became felt at its onset by local agrarian communities and farmers, which were unable to afford the expensive seeds, seeds they now had to buy rather than freely reuse and exchange, as well as the chemicals and farming machinery of the packets, and were rapidly driven into debt, bankruptcy bankruptcy and to suicide by the thousands. Intensive monocultures also meant the destruction of biodiversity, soil depletion, water pollution, cancer trains, deficient diets, and ultimately food insecurity and the deep social divisions and conflicts which inevitably follow all this. Vandana Shiva's ecofeminism emerges out of this history of relentless, relentless extraction and the violence it inflicted, particularly on women, a violence that was also sexualized. Shiva sees in it the collusion of patriarchy with capitalism as it helped degrade the role and the knowledge that women had in traditional agrarian communities. It is also a story of resistance, again, particularly by women, a story in which Shiva herself is an active participant. When recalling this history, 
how could one not also recall here the colonial and racial violence of the middle passes and the proto-capitalist model and function of the plantation system as a predecessor of industrial monoculture that clearly shows the multi-layered intrication between Anthropocene, Plantationocene and Capitalocene, to go back to Donna Haraway's critique of the generic masculine universal in Staying with the Trouble, as the anthropocenic subject or agent and what is for her an almost laughable rerun of the great phallic humanizing and modernizing adventure. Going back to the nitrogen Anthropocene, although we never left it, but only turned our attention to its histories and substrate of violence, extractionism and productivism, and to the nitrogen emergency, we need to ask ourselves whether and under which terms are we faced with a predicament outlined by Smil to tee up to the apparent irreplaceability of the harbor boss process and the question posed by the Eight Lansom Commission, can we feed a future population of 10 billion in the not too far future? Are we, should we be trapped within dilemmas such as either nitrogen anthropocene or global food crisis, insecurity and arrest? Shiva? Rejecting such terms, rephrases the question in her book, Who Really Fits the World, published in 2015. To this, she has a number of answers. Agroecology fits the world, not a violent knowledge paradigm. Living soil fits the world, not chemical fertilizers. Bees and butterflies fit the world, to be precise, we owe one third of the food we eat to pollinators, not poisons and pesticides. Pesticides do not control pests, they rather create them while causing along with climate change the dangerous decline of pollinators. And here we must uh, not fail to mention uh, Rachel uh, Carson's 1962 book, Silent Spring, the groundbreaking study that was the first to raise ecological awareness and concern with respect to the devastating impact of the use of toxic chemicals, mainly the extremely harmful pesticide DTT in America. Biodiversity fits the world, not toxic monocultures. Small scale farmers fit the world, not large scale industrial farms. Seed freedom fits the world, not seed dictatorship, the control and monopolization of seeds by a handful of big GMOs and chemical agribusiness giants such as Monsanto, Bayer, Dupont, Syngenta and Cargill. Localization feeds the world, not globalization. And women, who are globally the majority of farmers, feed the world, not corporations. Before we invest our hopes and anxieties in a new green revolution, which seems to be already underway and has now arrived in Africa with the promotion of GMOs thirsty for chemical fertilizers and the digital and speculative centralization of agriculture. Before we seek out technological fixes to problems, and I'm not saying that, uh, and neither does Siva, that we should mobilize techno-scientific resources and solutions, we need to examine what the different pathways and possible courses of action entail on the level of principles, or in Shiva's words, the knowledge paradigms that underlie chemical agribusiness and agroecology. The question of sustainability decisively involves a reflection on and a choice between worldviews, values, and what they prioritize. What is to be sustained? An agricultural and economic model that can only sustain itself through further exploitation, extraction, exhaustion, and substitution of resources, or the balance and the diversity of interconnected 
connected ecosystems on which humans depend and are also part of, according to what Shiva calls principles of agroecology. We need to hear more about agricultural and food movements, about agroecology, permaculture, local and global campaigns, initiatives and collaborations, farmers and women's, uh, and women's movements, such as La Via Campesina, Campesina. Uh, their stories, situations, aims and struggles, as well as the solutions they propose for sustainable and just agricultures and food systems. All these are ways of resisting nitrogen anthropocene. I want to turn now to the question of soil, as this is the main site or battlefield of the nitrogen and climate emergencies, albeit often an invisible and downtrodden one, and to the human soil relations at the core of the nitrogen anthropocene. This turn to the soil that has occurred recently in anthropology, environmental humanities, feminist and queer materialisms, following a time of soil crisis and degradation due to changes in the planet's biochemical flows and cycles, particularly since the great acceleration, as Will Hessen describes it in the 1950s, brings to view the interdependency of all these cycles, processes and entanglements of the organic and inorganic, the living with the non-living in the compositions and decompositions that make up soil, not as passive inert matter, but as the deep and ongoing connectedness and inseparability of living and dying, of thriving and decaying, lingering and making way. Soil as a badness and sustenance of such commingling is something to think about and care about. As Maria Puig de la Bella Casa says in her book, Matters of Care, Speculative Ethics in More Than Human Worlds, 2017, the time to care more and better for soils is now. Soil, she says, is not just a habitat or medium for plants and organisms, nor is it just a decomposed material, the organic and mineral and product of organism organism activity. Organisms are soil. A lovely soil can only exist with and through a multi-species community of biota that makes it, that contributes to its creation, end of quote. Thinking of soil-human relations as part of what Puig de la Belagaza calls her experiential immersion into ethical political configurations of ecological relations, or in short, alter biopolitics, involves rethinking and situating the human as dependent on and only existing in a web of living co-vulnerabilities as part of soil communities entailing that humans too and not only other organisms be included more decis decisively in the concept of the soil. This involves new ethicalities and obligations of care, but also a different soil odology disengaged from its extractionist and productionist conception. I want to mention here particularly Puig de la Bella Casa's notion of food web proposed as an ecological model of soil life and a conception that gives to the work of bacteria, fungi and earthworms those makers of soil, it's you. This is a conception of soil as a multi-species formation and symbiotic collaboration or community that is based on trophic relations, on metabolic chains and the multiple timelines that sustains itself and life through the food ways and webs of species feeding on each other, either through predation or through recycling its other's waste. I would like to link this quickly with what Jacques Derrida understands and puts forward in his interview with the late Jean-Philippe Nancy in Eating Well or the Calculation of the Subject as a pressing and unsurpassable ethical injunction, that of eating well, which must always also mean given to eat and even been eaten well, 
in all the possible material symbolic configurations and metonymies of introjection. This injunction, if taken seriously, as it must, and now more than ever, could mobilize resources and powers of destruction of what is called the human subject, the agent, the steward, the producer, the consumer, the manager, the master, or as Derrida would say, the carno-phallogocentric eater. The infinite metonymical question on the subject, I quote Derrida, of one must eat well, must be nourishing not only for me, for herself, which would thus eat badly, it must be shared, as you might put it, and not only in language. One must eat well, does not mean above all taking in and grasping in itself, but learning and giving to it, learning to give the other to eat. And he continues, one never eats entirely on one's own. This constitutes the rule underlying the statement, one must eat well. It is a rule offering infinite hospitality. End of quote. Infinite hospitality and care offered not as such, not given according to the rules and conditions of the host or master of the house. The one in the one must eat well must be resituated here in his web of living called vulnerabilities, immersed as Buick de la Pila Casa suggests into ethical political reconfigurations of ecological relations or relational ontologies. Capitalized anthropos as the anthropocenic subject has only come this far. In geological terms and timeline, timelines not that far at all. And now we'll have to give way, step down, seek his place among his chthonic fellow creatures. What Derrida proposes elsewhere as a critical biodegradability, the decomposition and return back to the soil, which could also apply to concepts that have run their course, should first apply to that definition of the human before he chokes the soil in toxic waste. If we had time, we would relate this to Haraway's ethics of composts and to her return to an original understanding of human as humus, as compost. Summing up all these thoughts and injunctions in the absolute urgency to rethink and reconfigure human metabolism, not only in the way we burn fossil fuels, but also with respect to our participation in the nitrogen cycle, in the way we capture, digest, and waste nitrogen, I would like to finish with Thomas Nail's theory of the earth, 2021, and its evocation of the image of an earth devouring itself, eating, and wasting itself away along the dissipative movement of cosmic expenditure. Seeing ourselves within this larger picture of what Nails, Nail calls cosmic autophagy should not drive us to want to undermine terrestrial expenditure, to do everything we can in our power to slow it down. Not allowing the earth to die, says Nail, comes down to not allowing it to live so it can die. Life, says Neil, is a gift given to the organism to intensify the expenditure of the cosmos and itself. By dying well, it gets to live well." End of quote. All physical things occur as folds, vortices, and circulations along this cosmic expenditure of energy. All life forms and their metabolisms our experiments in composition and decomposition, life's contribution to the increase of energy expenditure. The Anthropocene, in this sense, would be a geo-bioengineering experiment that reduces the net expen expenditure of the Earth, that rather than expanding, seeks to accumulate, store, extract and pile up non-biodegradable things, what Puig de la Pela Casa calls manufactured endurance, inflicting immense violence in the process. And the nitrogen anthropocene is another shorthand and aspect of this process. 
what must we do? We must go with the flow. Eat well by cultivating what Neil calls the ethics of expenditure, which is in practice an ethics of compost or else metabolic communism. Reciprocate to the soil by partaking in the task of cosmic degradation and the motion along which life happens. If we want to survive, states Nail, then our best chance is to follow these guiding maxims. First, increase planetary expenditure. Second, compost everything. Third, increase diversity. This will never happen, however, if we fail to learn from the histories of violence and abuse that anthropocenic reasoning has been sentimented upon, if we fail to understand that social and environmental justice is food justice and the agricultural act that it is. I'm not saying that the nitrogen anthropocene is to be thought in separation. I'm saying that to move beyond the Anthropocene, we would need to think both the carbon and the nitrogen and all Anthropocenes and the manners of extraction together and with the same urgency. Perhaps what the Nitrogen Anthropocene does is to introduce back to the reasoning of sentimentation of the carbon Anthropocene the metabolic circulation of lives and matters and help us see human life death in its connection to and immersion in it. That's it. Thank you very much for your patience. Well, I wish to thank uh, Professor Steiko for this wonderful talk. Um, I think we can take a five minute break. Okay. And come back with questions. Please don't leave us. Uh, stay with us because the Q&A is often uh, the moment when we can really go deep into some of the really important questions that um, were raised in this talk. So um, thank you again. See you in a few minutes. Okay. See you in five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think so. And I would like to welcome to the panel also uh, Professor George Smith, uh, president and founder of IDSVA. Thank you, George, for being here. What a great uh, place to be today, Samantha. Thanks for having me. And thank you, Alina, for making this such a magnificent experience. Okay, thank so. You, yeah, I'm looking at the questions and a lot of them have been, been answered uh, in terms of the bibliography. Uh, although Nicole Marie Melchick does say that my soul feels so happy after this lecture. Thanks so much to all of you, um, which is, you know, pretty much the sentiment we've, we've all uh, felt uh, after having listened to, to uh, your presentation, Alina. Thank you. I think we have uh, a question. I do have a question. I do have a question. Um, this is from CJ Stevens. If we think of soil as the quintessential host that makes room, shares, neutralizes poisons, can we also think of it as what uh, at, think of it as what to turn toward when thinking about what to give back? Can we step aside as we think of hospitality as the fundamental virtue of the soil? Can we step step back? Can we step aside? Yeah, step back, yeah. Step, step aside is, is how CJ worded it. Uh, that, that's a beautiful question. It's a beautiful uh, uh, thought, uh, uh, thinking about the soil. Uh, we, we, you know, and going back to uh, uh, Maria Puig de la Pelacasa, and she, she's talking about matters of, uh, of care. Um, but it's uh, more about our immersion in the soil. And as you say, it's uh, a thinking of ourselves, of the human within the conception of the soul, thinking ourselves as part of the soul and not uh, just as uh, uh, 
the cares in the sense that the soul is that uh, that thing over there, that substance that we need to to manage and uh, uh, take care, care of. Uh, uh, so I think it does complicate in beautiful ways uh, the notion of uh, uh, the hospitality. Um, we are not hosting our, our hosts to 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 uh, the soil in in our, you know in our fields or in our, our gardens and 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 uh, uh, have a responsibility of taking uh, uh, care of it. Um, we inhabit it. We are immersed in it. Um, we are part of uh, uh, this web of relations. Um, so uh, in a way, we don't step aside. We are, we are, we are in it. We are immersed uh, with it. Uh, and uh, I think what we can learn from this kind of, uh, you, know, you know, this, this beautiful uh, uh, thoughts uh, 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 is to, to begin to think of our, our, ourselves uh, otherwise, in other ways, as uh, immersed in that food web and there are relationship of, of care. It doesn't mean that, uh, um, you know, there, there is no struggle uh, or violence involved there in it because it's, it's always oh, it has to do with eating the other or, uh, uh, um, or being eaten uh, uh, as well. But uh, um, this is the web of life that we need to, to respect and, and to sustain because there's nothing else. Mm. I don't know if that answered the, the question, but uh, it, it was beautifully uh, uh, formulated. Thank you. Thank you so much. And there's another question here uh, from Angela Dunlap. Thank you for the time you gave to research this topic. I would like to draw a connection to your opening question that asks after the unfortunate gap in thinking about the nitrogen cycle and the political economical connections that you addressed in your talk as well. In your wider research, have you given thought to the 1% uh, the one percent's economic interests in fertilizers that disrupt the nitrogen cycle and the suppression of information on the dangers of disrupting this cycle by search engines. Yes, yeah. I mean, uh, that, that, that's uh, the question. Why we're not uh, talking? Why are we not uh, hearing uh, that much about uh, the nitrogen uh, uh, Anthropocene? And uh, um, as I mentioned in the uh, paper, uh, that uh, uh, committee that came together to, to research the nitrogen emergency, they quickly realized that uh, the proposals could not be um, thus open and, and daring. And so they had to compromise with uh, proposing cuts in nitrogen waste, not in the production and the, in the distribution of um, uh, synthetic uh, fertilizers. And, and because they were running against a very powerful um, corporate uh, interest, which, which is the 1%. And actually, I don't remember now the exact title, but this is uh, one of the most uh, recent uh, books by uh, Vandana Shiva about the one uh, percent, and uh, you know he's uh, fiercely critical of uh, corporations, and she doesn't shy from uh, naming names, um, <laughs> calling names, and um, uh, so yeah, that 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 that's that that's uh, uh, is uh, is the issue. Um, while there is this culture. Um, so almost of uh, secrecy, but now it, it's getting to be uh, uh, more talked about. Um, but but still, the focus um, uh, is uh, uh, on, on carbon. But nitrogen seems to be far more dangerous at this point than uh, uh, than carbon. Um, I mean, I I don't know um, if it's a, a good time, but uh, I have it. Uh, a table uh, from um, Will Stevens. Uh, uh, Will Stevens. Um, let me just. I don't want to take too much uh, uh, time, but I think it's so uh, so telling. Do 
Do you see? Do you see it on your screens? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah. See. So this is uh, a table about uh, the planetary uh, uh, boundaries. Uh, and you can see uh, here, you have the climate change, you have the atmospheric carbon uh, dioxide, uh, current status, pre-industrial value, proposed boundary. And you see, of course, that the current status uh, has exceeded uh, uh, the proposed boundary. Um, but if you compare it uh, down, down here with the, the nitrogen cycle, Proposed boundary 35, current status. So it has exceeded it by far, uh, far more than uh, the climate uh, change, the carbon dioxide and pre-industrial value, zero. So I think uh, uh, it's very telling the same, you know, with uh, the rate of biodiversity uh, loss, uh, again, um, it's more alarming. Um, I'll stop sharing. Lena, I would like to ask a question um, mm -hmm. in relation to this lack of visibility to the topic. And I wonder if um, if you have given any thought about the relation, the connections that we have that um, there's not everywhere. And there's a, a big difference between the North, uh, the North and the South. But in, um, but in terms of the abundance of food and the amount of waste of food, food is one of the top uh, three uh, waste products actually that make landfills. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, uh, it, it creates like a very, um, it, it creates a big difficulty because on the one hand we see this enormous quantity of food that is being thrown away. And on the other one, we're thinking, oh, uh, there's, th th it looks like there's enough if it would be distributed. So I think, um, and I, I, I believe there's kind of a, a false perception, but I think because it's our first connection with it, it like it kind of um, makes the creates kind of a, a veil for the the actual crisis of nitrogen. I don't know if you yeah. can speak a little more about that. Yeah, yeah, no, you, yeah, you're absolutely right, and I think it's one third of the total of the global uh, food production that uh, uh, is wasted. Uh, and um, in developing countries, it's mainly wasted at the level of uh, of production. And uh, um, in the West, uh, uh, you know, at the stage of uh, consumption. Uh, so it has a lot to do also with uh, with uh, with our attitudes uh, uh, towards food, um, and that that goes to show that you know all, all the emergency, all the worried about uh, the um, the imminent uh, global food security uh, a crisis. In a way, it's a false uh, uh, emergency, uh, and uh, I think. Uh, it's amenable to uh, political and economic uh, uh, use and, uh, and uh, exploitation. So you have all these corporations heavily uh, invest in, uh, uh, in new uh, technologies and in new, uh, launching new green uh, uh, revolutions that would be extremely destructive. I'm not saying that uh, all the um, technology that uh, is uh, being developed and uh, biotechnologies that are used uh, in, uh, in agriculture are part uh, of, uh, of uh, this scheme. And obviously we need uh, uh, all the solutions uh, uh, we can get. But I think the problem is, again, on the level of, uh, of, of, uh, of principles and what at the end we want to, uh, to sustain. Do we want to sustain this dominant agricultural um, uh, paradigm or, uh, or model uh, at, at, uh, at all costs? Um, or do we want to sustain uh, following Shiva's uh, agroecological uh, principles, uh, uh, values, um, local communities, uh, biodiversity, uh, the balance of, uh, of uh, ecosystems. Um, so yeah, you know, we need to be pragmatic and find uh, ways of, of not wasting uh, uh, all these foods. But then we have to, to ask why is that uh, food wasted uh, uh, in developing countries in this way? And uh, why uh, uh, consumers are wasting food uh, uh, in, in the West and, and uh, reflect uh, on all this uh, um, on the level of, uh, of values. And above all, 
in the name of uh, environmental justice and food justice. I think uh, um, that should be the point of, uh, of uh, the departure of this, uh, this debate. Yes, thanks. Um, I don't know if you were answering Angela Dunlap's uh, question. Is, was that uh, still your, your question uh, that you were answering, uh, Patricia? Because we do have an additional question that, that I believe that you've touched on in terms of sustainability, but I do wanna read the question, if that's okay. Uh, she asked, uh, you asked the question of sustainability as what should we aim to sustain? I am paraphrasing here, suggesting that we need to sustain diversity. Can you explain the sentiment further, specifically addressing the language of sustain and the inability to sustain diversity as, as it? Diversity relies heavily on the accident, which we have, have no control over. In other words, how can diversity be sustained if it relies on its own unsustainable existence? Mm. That's a very interesting uh, question. Uh, I mean, we hear so much about sustainability and it's all about uh, uh, sustainable uh, uh, food systems, health and sustainable uh, uh, food systems. Uh, yes, and we, we must ask what is, what we want to sustain and what uh, uh, sustaining means. Um, and I've already uh, said, and, and this is also much following uh, uh, Shiva, that there are different understandings of uh, sustainability. Uh, the, the dominant agricultural model, which is often called conventional uh, agriculture, seeks to sustain itself, uh, to sustain this uh, global food system, not allowing it uh, uh, to collapse. And that would mean thinking um, to find new uh, uh, resources, uh, new places of uh, uh, investment, sustaining uh, uh, diversity. I think it's 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 a good point. Um, it seems that these two uh, words do not sit very well uh, together. They trouble uh, uh, each other because uh, uh, diversity has that uh, uh, randomness that. Uh, um, uh, accidental uh, uh, element uh, uh, in it. Um, perhaps caring for it, respecting it, allowing it uh, 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 to be, uh, would be a better uh, word of uh, describing a, a relationship to, uh, to it. And but, but, but sustainability has become a quite uh, standardized uh, 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 term. But uh, it, it's very important to think about it um, and understand in what way we are using it and what uh, uh, values we, we, uh, we tie uh, uh, to it. Um, yeah, I, I think that's what I had uh, uh, to say, but it's, it's making me uh, think, uh, and uh, I think it could be linked uh, um, uh, to what I said uh, at the end of the lecture about uh, uh, Thomas uh, Nail, and uh, uh, for him, it's all about uh, uh, expenditure uh, and uh, the events, what occurs, uh, uh, the accidents that, that happen. Um, uh, along this movement of uh, of uh, energy uh, dissipation, and said that we might allow, we must allow these ex uh, uh, experiments to keep on happening, and and that's also uh, uh, diversity. Um, the idea of sustaining, preserving, storing, uh, accumulating. Uh, which these, these are ideals and, and values uh, of, uh, uh, of Western uh, uh, modernity. These are the problems. Um, so uh, yeah, we have to, to think about, to reflect about uh, the values um, that are associated uh, with, with the way that we use it's time, the term uh, sustainability. It's not my prefer, preferred term uh, anyway, but so, so uh, thank you very much for this question. I, would, 
try to encourage maybe another question or I'll, I'll we are. George. I'll jump in if I may, uh, Samantha. Thank you so much. And again, thanks everybody. Uh, great questions all the way around. Yeah, it does seem to me that uh, the accident of diversity is the enemy of scientific control, which will always want to dominate and annihilate what is diverse. We see that in, in so many ways in the world today. But, but you know, uh, the elegance of your, of your lecture uh, to me is, is so much about sustainability and its balance because you, you begin with the Derrida's notion of hospitality and come back to that at the end in such a rich way. Um, initially, when you talked about Derrida's notion of hospitality, you included the word gift, which of course always requires gratitude, which is the essence of humility and the opposite of mastery and domination. I wonder if we could just talk a little bit more about that. About the gift. Yes, and, and its relation to gratitude and, and Humility is the essence of gratitude and the opposite of mastery and domination. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's, that's a lovely uh, uh, question. And you will remember that for Derrida, the gift is uh, something impossible. <laughs> uh, in, in the sense that it's, it's not this present thing that you know you, you're receiving and who's giving it uh, to you. So it, it, it's not about an exchange between uh, two subjects uh, and uh, there you have uh, uh, the gift. So it's not part of this kind of uh, uh, economy. Right. Uh, but uh, uh, I think, and... Then again, with Derrida, there is so this this uh, complication uh, of life or death, uh, which is what I've been talking about uh, in terms of uh, soul and uh, the compositions of uh, life, death, the decomposition and and, uh, and uh, decomposition. But I think I could relate to the thought of uh, of uh, the gift. Um, uh, with what I said uh, uh, in this this talk, that uh, of the, the gift is also to receive uh, your food uh, and to reciprocate, but you don't know to whom you're reciprocating and uh, and and uh, and what uh, by allowing yourself to be eaten. Well, uh, by returning something to. Uh, to the soil, uh, we are chronic beings, <laughs> so we return uh, uh, to the soil and going with the flow mean, means that uh, I've been re-immersed in the, the nitrogen uh, uh, cycle. Uh, so th thank you, George, for that. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it made uh, this thought uh, even richer. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, Patricia, you have your hand up? Oh, I did before. I forgot to, to take it down. <laughs> but yeah, we can talk about soil all day. No, I don't want to take more of your time. This was so beautiful. I really enjoyed it so much. Thank you very much. It was really wonderful. Thank you, Patricia. Great. I think we can uh, probably end it here if there are no more questions. And, uh, you know, we have. I don't want to abuse your hospitality, Lina. <laughs> You've given us so much, and um, it's really worthwhile spending some time and pondering these questions. So thanks again. Thank, thank you. you thank you very much for, for being uh, here, and thank you very much for, for your questions and your contributions. And I really enjoy it, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to go away and, and keep working on, uh, on, on this, uh, this topic. I'm more inspired now. Well, you inspired all of us. So thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you all. Thank you, Novel. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. Thank you, thank you George. And, and thanks to everyone who came to this talk today. It's lovely to see so many of you. Yeah. And ciao, Alina. Bye-bye. Ciao, Patricia. See you now. soon. Bye-bye.